All right, um, thank you. Thank you for coming today. Um, and uh, I want to introduce one of our graduates of cohort nine. nine. Cohort nine. Uh, this is Dr. Susan Olson, who actually, when we met, she was actually my research assistant for, I think, about a year. And then I lost her um, <laughs> to teaching within our teacher rev department. And uh, so it was fascinating because when we talk about the pathways, you just never know what direction you're going to go. So she went from research assistant to already a colleague and was sharing space in my office uh, while she was teaching in our, our programs. Um, upon graduation, she took a different career path and uh, upon going to her son's graduation, was hearing about this report. And I thought, wow, this is fascinating at so many levels. And recognizing that her doctorate in from our program, I think really has, has created an opening of how she's perceiving what she does. So I thought it would be wonderful to share it here. Um, so we're going to have our students who are in cohort 11. Um, they're in the writing aspects, and then Dr. Cho, um, who is here as part of our, our special education department. Um, Dr. You know, we have Dr. Pete here, Dr. Benet here, who's, who's been you know, a valuable part of our, our most recent cohort that graduated. So we have sort of the gamut represented here today. Um, and then with the, of course, having it recorded, we can share it with others. So, Dr. Olson. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you for joining me this afternoon. And um, uh, I wanted to talk about the work that I'm doing um, for the State Department of Education and the Special Education Division. But I first wanted to talk a little bit more about um, how I found my way into um, the role that I now have for the State Department of Education. Um, so I originally was an English teacher uh, for four years. I was during the time when there were no, um, uh, not enough teachers in California, and so I went in as an emergency credential and earned my credential at um, San Jose State. And then um, I started at Gilroy High School, moved up to um, Sacramento, and so I, I taught for eight years. And then I went into teacher education um, and it was a district intern credential program, so I was teaching in the credential program and eventually became the director of the program. <coughs> and um, that program went into um, charter schools. Um, so I, I like to consider myself a, a trailblazer. I've, I've done a lot of, of work on very new um, uh, trails when it was, I started in the AmeriCorps right when um, President Clinton had taken office and had brought AmeriCorps together and then I went into um, charter schools, I did alternative types of credentialing and so it's interesting that I ended up at the state because to me the state is a, a totally different um, avenue that I, I really never imagined myself. Um, but I had basically when I was uh, graduating from the doctorate program, I had been working part-time here at Sacramento State. So it was like starting over again, that, you know, where do I want to go with my career? And I really decided I had um, three, er three things that were very important to me. Um, one is that I wanted to be able to go somewhere that I felt like I could make a difference in K-12 education and be a change agent. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to, I needed to stay local. I have children that are, you know, still in school and um, so I, I wanted to stay within the, the Sacramento area. And then I also wanted to make sure that I was still focusing on equity. So all of the um, positions that I was in when I was a teacher or a teacher educator, I really had a strong focus on equity for students, particularly in urban schools. And so, uh, as I started to apply for positions, I, um, this position came open with the California Department of Education um, in the Special Education Division, which is an area that I hadn't spent a lot of time working in special education. Um, and so, uh, basically, in our role, we deal with racial disproportionality within special education. So it's a part of the um, IDEA regulations. It's also referred to as equity in IDEA. Um, and so states are required to provide um, for, and so they have to collect and they have to um, examine data from each 
LEA. So we refer to them as um, local education agencies because we're looking at both districts and charter schools. And so you'll hear me refer to it as LEAs, but imagine districts or imagine a, a charter school environment. Um, so the states, they report their information, or the LEAs report their information to the state. And then our data unit looks at the numbers of, of students that are being um, identified and um, disciplined and placed based on race and ethnicity. Um, and so the first one, identification, it's children with disabilities, including the identification of children as children with disabilities within placement <laughs> settings. So for identification, um, we're looking at students who are identified for special education, and then we're also looking at students identified for special education within specific disability categories. And then we're looking at the numbers compared to um, the other students within the school. So we would pull out African American students, Latino students, Asian students, and use that to compare, you know, how frequently are they being identified. And then we look at the placement. So we're looking at students who have been placed into least restrictive environments, and that could be outside of the um, public school setting in a non-public, or it could be students being taken out of general education setting for more than 45% um, of their time. So if they're being taken out of general ed and, and t uh, placed in settings that are just for special education students, we again, we're looking at, well, how often is that happening and, and by what racial, um, and then we look at it by each racial group. And then finally, um, we're also looking at disciplinary removals. So looking at the special education population within um, the district or charter, then within that population, what, are, what is the rate of students being removed from their setting because of discipline and based on race and ethnicity? So the, this is a, a definition. Disproportionality occurs when students of a specific racial or ethnic group are identified for special education suspended or expelled or placed in more restrictive settings in greater numbers than their representation in the whole school district. So we're really taking the, um, the district and looking at their numbers compared to their own numbers. So we're not comparing them to the state, we're comparing them to what they're doing just within their own district and um, is there an over-representation of a particular racial or ethnic group being identified, placed, or disciplined. Did you have a question? Just briefly. Yeah. Or did you look at any other variables like uh, socioeconomic status or English language learning? Or was it strictly we by race? Strictly by race. race. Um, but we do actually um, have some specific uh, requirements around uh, second language learners. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at um, are they being assessed in their um, home language um, when they're determining if they have, but that's after they've been identified, so a part of like our monitoring. Um, so as a state, we have to um, monitor disproportionality and significant disproportionality. And so disproportionality is um, the overrepresentation, um, and then I'll talk just a little bit about significant disproportionality in a minute. So I'm a part of um, the unit that focuses on the disproportionality and the, our purpose is to monitor and assist the LEAs. And so when I came into my role um, with the state, um, a lot of it was the monitoring. And so a lot of this year has been about asking the question about, well, what does it mean to assist? So my role is to monitor and give technical assistance. It's the two parts of my role. Um, but the state has a history of just doing the monitoring, and now they're being sued. The state of California has some major lawsuits happening because of their uh, monitoring of special education. And so when I had the opportunity to be in a room and talk about, well, you know, how can we really monitor if we're not actually going to the schools and seeing what's happening and spending time with the district leaders to see about the work that they're doing. 
um, that's been kind of where I, I've figured out is, is my opportunity for leadership, is to, to talk about, well, how can I know if a school's really trying to address it? Um, because a lot of, or a district, a lot of times the district is coming back to us and saying, well, the, our data is wrong. We, we, recal we, we recalculated it ourselves and, and you have our data wrong. And so um, a lot of discussions have to be about um, why you know, the data is just the starting point and let's talk about what practices and policies you have in place. And so that's what I'll talk about. The, um, so um, this is the language of the law that um, I, I'm discussing. This is within um, IDEA that addresses disproportionality um, it's also part of the big system and, and that we're, we're still trying to um, work out where we fit into California system of support. Um, and so the California system of support is now um, meant to nest our local education agencies within all this additional support from the county offices of education. Then we also have uh, geographic lead agencies. So some of these county offices of education that have been shown to be um, experts within certain fields like uh, math initiative, community engagement, equity, uh, they're, they're taking the lead to help train up other uh, county offices of education to better support their LEAs, to better support their students. Um, and then <coughs> for special education, um, we also have um, regional experts that are, are looking at disproportionality and some of the other issues related to special education. So that's just kind of how we all fit into that system of support from the district level and schools um, all the way to the Department of Education. So this is ideal. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of work to be done, at, you know, from this level to what we ideally want to see happening. So we'll talk about the impact this has on students as it relates to disproportionality. Um, so if a student is misidentified for special education, then it begins to limit their ability to receive an appropriate education and the right educational services. And so if a student has dealt with trauma, if a student has um, fallen behind in reading or math, instead of addressing the issues that caused that trauma or um, the things that have happened that the student hasn't caught on to reading as, as quickly as you would want them to, um, they're being referred to special education at alarming rates, especially um, black and brown students. Um, but we actually also look at um, all race and ethnicities, and we're also finding, um, especially in some of our urban settings, that um, white is disproportionately being identified. Um, we have a, a huge issue in the Lake County area of white children being identified as emotionally disturbed when they're dealing with significant trauma. And so what are things that these districts can do to try to address that trauma and to avoid labeling a, a child as emotionally disturbed, which stays with them for the rest of their lives? So the inequities, um, outcomes, and opportunities. Oh, oh the computer's telling me something. One of the things that we um, talk about a lot, and this is a, actually a really good article called Get Out Black Male Suspensions in California Public Schools. Um, it was published in 2018. Um, students are, sus sorry, suspended or expelled students are three times more likely to end up in the juvenile justice system in, in some way or another. And this is even just one time suspended. That, that the rate of their likelihood to 
end up in contact with the juvenile system goes up three times. <clears throat> so the misidentifying of students, it limits their ag access to rigorous curricula. So um, if they're being removed from the general education classroom, a lot of times they're not getting that full spectrum of the curriculum and access to um, more able peers. And they also are um, socially stigmatized um, and it also um, is leading to ra racial separation within schools. And so when a high number of students of one ethnicity is being identified and placed in, in special education, and outside of the general ed classroom, you're actually seeing segregation happening within the school. Uh, so just a little bit of national data. Um, students with disabilities are twice as likely to be suspended throughout each school level compared to students without disabilities. And that's um, some uh, national statistics. Um, Students of color as a whole, as well as individual racial groups, do not commit more discipline offenses than their white peers, but black, Latina, and Native American students in the aggregate receive sustainably more school discipline than their white peers and receive harsher and longer punishment than their white peers received for other offenses. So there's been a lot of study, yes. Um, so, students with this, your first blue thing up there, students with disabilities are twice as likely. So, what I'm wondering is, is there any breakdown by type of disability? Because, I mean, disabilities is this huge, right, massive category, right? So, is that mostly like ED students, or are there any breakdowns? Um, I, in this particular study, um, well, it's... Well, not necessarily in this study, but... Right. Yeah. So, when, we, when we're looking at the data, um, we do look at the breakdown and, and who is getting over-identified by race and ethnicity, but not necessarily what, did, like, what needs to this. It's just the whole category of special education students who are being disciplined. So, it, we don't have that broken down. That that might be, it might be really that interesting. might be something interesting and useful to, I mean, I'm not, I'll leave it to the other faculty experts in the room, but it right. seems to me, yeah. drilling down on that might be yeah. Generally useful. speaking, students with EBD, mm -hmm. emotional disturbance, as well as their behavior disorders, they get more suspensions than other students with other disabilities. Right. So they might yeah. not be twice as likely to that group. Even more, more, even more yeah. right? So exactly. Yeah. Well, and we are yeah. seeing um, in a lot of the <laughs> districts that are um, identified as disproportionate, for the ones that it's multiple, mm -hmm. it's usually the same race and it's disciplined and then one other. And, and a lot of the time it's emotionally disturbed or OHI. Right. Um, right. Which we also are seeing some districts who they've been identified for ED, mm -hmm. so then they start reassessing the students, and then now they're they've been labeled OHI. Mm -hmm. It doesn't solve the problem because then you're disproportionate in OHI, right. so they're doing like a a I'm dance. Yeah. OHI or yeah. other yeah. health impairment, which include their uh, other health impairment, uh, including ADHD. Yes, HY. exactly. Uh, attention deficit hyperactivity oh, right. disorder. Right, and so those are kind of the two major yeah. ones that we're seeing when discipline is also an issue. Yes. <clears throat> so um, American Indian and Alaska Native students are 1.0 times more likely identified as having a learning disability. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it, within California, um, the groups we're seeing are white, <laughs> In, in very you know small pockets, um, African American, Latino, and Native American. So if Native American is a significant population, so um, Santa Rosa is one, um, then they're very likely to be identified as over-identifying for special education. <laughs> African American students are two times more likely identified. Um, and so, the way that the state identifies um, students, or I'm sorry, LEAs that are um, 
disproportionate is based on a risk ratio, and the risk ratio is, um, threshold is three, which means that we don't even identify them as disproportionate until that group of students, that race or ethnicity, is three times more likely to be identified. And so that's, and that's been lowered over the years. So when I first came on, we were in like a, going from just doing it when they were five times more likely to lowering it to three times more likely. Just uh, one other question about these statistics. So sure. 1.92 and 2.2 times more likely than the overall mean or than white students or than white natives compared to who, I guess? Overall, like so all other. So including, the, including the students that are being over identified. Yes. So, um, and the way that we work out our, our ratios is just taking out that race and ethnicity and comparing it to all other race and ethnicities. Um, and another issue that we're just trying to wrap our heads around is that the the federal laws around IDEA that are triggering California to monitor this more is that in um, July 2020, less than a year from now, um, we will also have to start monitoring disproportionality for preschools. Um, and it's becoming quite a discussion because preschools don't report in the same ways that K through 12 education reports and so 250 preschoolers are expelled every day. It's usually uh, just, you know, this isn't the right fit. Um, you probably need to take them to a different school or, you know, they're not ready for preschool. And so a lot of um, the data may not even be reflected because of the way that um, preschools report aren't the same as if you would report um, for a kindergartner. The same thing is for um, suspending. They might just call a parent and say they're having a bad day, they need to go home, and that's not necessarily being reported. And we're only monitoring um, schools that are funded by the state. So like Head Start and um, some of the in state schools. <clears throat> Um, so more, of, I'm, I'm already running out of time, so I'm just gonna kind of go through. So African American males are 5.8% of the California school enrollment, but they're 18% of suspensions, which is what we're finding very um, consistently in districts, is that you will see, and I was actually just at a um, meeting last night in Merced. So Merced is one of um, the districts that we've been working out with, and they're very, being very proactive in the work to address disproportionality. Um, and their numbers were like 6% and 22%. So they were 6% were African American, but 22% uh, were being suspended and expelled. And it mirrors in special education as well. So we're only looking at students in special ed who are suspended and expelled, but it's very similar. You'll see the percentage is lower, but the number of suspension and expulsions are higher for African American students in special ed. So for every 100 African American students, 42 days of instruction was lost as compared to 11 days for white students. Um, and so this is um, a California report um, in 2018. 297 children with disabilities aged three to five were suspended or expelled. And again, that's only in the preschools that we that, that, that are publicly funded. African American students in K through three are five four six times more likely to be suspended than other students in California. And we know that there's a law that says that they cannot be um, suspended for willful defiance anymore. But we're finding that there, there isn't much difference in numbers, and they just are um, coding it differently. Um, and then, according to the California Healthy Kids Survey, which again, not a lot of data is reported, but the ones who are reporting black and Hispanic students, um, they are feeling less safe and connected in California schools. 
Okay, so I'm just about o over time, but um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we do for these chronic years. So um, we review yearly for disproportionality. So if a, um, an LEA has been identified disproportionate, um, then we look at um, after three years, and this is the federal requirement, is that um, we have to identify them as significantly disproportionate. And then the rules and expectations are, are a bit different. Um, so they have to be out in the same area with the same population for three years in a row. So we have a lot of LEAs that are never getting to this because it kind of jumps around the identification um, or you know what they decide their disability is, they'll do some swaps or maybe the racial or ethnic group there um, sometimes are some shifts. So the ones that are chronically having the issue in the same category with the same race or ethnicity um, for three consecutive years, they're determined to be significantly disproportionate. Um, and they will be required, and this is a lot of the work that I do, is um, they need to uh, do a root cause analysis. They have to hold a stakeholder group. So when I was in Merced last night, they were having um, their very first um, African American Parent Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, it was fantastic to see a room full of African American students and they did some great activities um, where they wanted to ask them focus questions so that they could really get feedback from African American parents about um, what is important to them. Um, and then uh, the methodology changed um, that's when it went from five to three, and then also um, the denominator being only students within special education. Um, and like I said, preschool will be included in 2020. So the major bite that California, um, as, as a state that we have, is that once they're identified as significantly disproportionate, then they have to withhold 15% of their IDA funding and um, put it towards this plan to eradicate disproportionality. Um, and so a lot of that needs to go into their general education and what, um, what are teachers doing that are referring students out or um, suspending students. And then what types of um, interventions, MTSS, PBIS, so that's a lot of what we see happening and then also um, you know, the really good districts, they really start looking at their data um, as uh, quarterly discipline data or, you know, looking back and seeing like the students and going through their files and how, what was their journey that led them to special education. And um, so each, so they come up with a plan and then every quarter they have to report on, on their activities and what they're doing towards their plan. So what I was saying earlier that I've, I've really had to, you know, talk about, well, the monitoring also has to be the technical assistance because um, you can't expect them to just go out and, and change because a lot of it is, is changing mindsets and changing implicit bias. And we, that's not going to happen unless they address it face on and they address what's happening <laughs> in their classrooms and relying just on a risk ratio is not going to change it or trying to mess with the data. It's really about systems and policies that need to change. And so that's what we encourage with this plan that they have to develop. So really, it's a combination of practice, policies, and beliefs that really is what um, just is a result disproportionality is a result of Seems that. Like you really have to get down to practices inside the classroom because yeah. where do mm -hmm. suspensions mm -hmm. originate? They originate from the classroom. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I think that's why the 15% of special education IDEA funds go to Janet to prevent right. the MTSS, yes. Absolutely, and we're seeing in um, San Francisco Unified is another one that they've done a lot of work around trying to um, create better mm -hmm. um, discipline policies and training their teachers. And then they also mm -hmm. um, have been doing some things with preschool age children to address 
um, trauma and some of the emotional things that are happening prior to ever identifying them as special ed or emotionally disturbed. And I actually went to visit a preschool. They have some really amazing things happening there where they've got a counselor there, they have a behaviorist, and each person is assigned to one child. And so, but then they also rotate. I know. <laughs> but each one who goes, and it's, it's like a six week program. And so then they go back to their preschool. But once they've gone through that, they haven't had any that have been identified in kinder or first grade for, uh, or referred for special ed. So I, I can talk about this all night. Um, I know you have to get to classes. Yes. Um, what kind of shifts in the data have you seen with uh, crises like the campfire or the opioid crisis? You know, as far as like, this affecting kids and them either moving out of the area to different areas. So the like I, when I was talking about the Lake County group, mm -hmm. we've been really having to have a lot of conversations about um, the opioid crisis and the things that the kids are dealing with and the, the trauma. Um, and so the there's the attitude of well they're dealing with this outside of here. There's nothing we can do about it. Mm -hmm. And so of course they're emotionally disturbed or right. you know like. And so we've had to talk a lot about, well, what about wraparound services? What about, you know, different things that you can do to bring, you know, the experts into the schools that, like the educators alone can't address all of these different, so how do we, you know, bring that support? Um, as for the fires, you know, I don't think we have any major significant disproportionality um, up in that area, but we have, had to deal with lost records and mm -hmm. like lost yeah. IEPs and so right. we, this right. has been like a keep everything right. digital <laughs> yeah. kind of but yeah not anything as far as moving around I haven't heard much about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.